Hi, I'm Claire Wade from the Geological Survey of South Australia, and today I'll be talking about some of the work I did as part of my PhD at the University of Adelaide. Um, and this was looking at the geochemical and isotopic variation within the Hildebrand Suite and the Gawler Range Volcanics. This talk will focus on how we use geochemistry to understand different magmatic processes um, and the magmatic evolution, but also how we use different components within the large igneous province to understand some of those different processes. So in a sense, every rock has its own story and we're pulling together each of those individual stories to get a better understanding of the bigger picture of that province. This talk will be divided into um, four parts. So after a brief introduction to the Hildebrand Suite and the Gawler Range Volcanics, um, we'll then look at how we use mafic rocks and their geochemistry to understand the composition and the source of the mantle. We'll then look at volcanic rocks and how we can use their geochemistry and isotope geochemistry um, to better understand magmatic evolution and make some comments on um, models for formation. We'll then look at um, isotopes and how they can inform us about the different sources, different mantle and crustal end member sources, but also the interaction between those two end members. And the last um, section is looking at zircon geochemistry and how we can use this um, as an additional um, layer of information to better understand some of those magmatic processes and sources. Introducing the Hildebrand Suite and the Gawler Range Volcanics. So here we have a simplified solar geology map of the Gawler Craton, highlighting the distribution of the Gawler Range Volcanics and the Hildebrand Suite. The Gawler Range Volcanics are divided into two main components, and these are the Lower Gawler Range Volcanics, or the Lower GRV, and the Upper Gawler Range Volcanics. Um, or the upper GRV. Within the lower GRV, um, we have more compositional variation. There are um, basaltic units all the way through to rhyolitic units, whereas in the upper GRV, these are predominantly felsic, they're um, dacitic and rhyolitic units. The Hildebrand suite are the intrusive component, and these are divided into a felsic and a mafic component. So the red are the granites and the dark green are the mafic intrusive rocks. Within the mafic Hildebrand suite, there is a variety of different rock types, and these include um, gabbronorites all the way through to diorites and dolerites. These are just some examples of some of the compositional variation that we see in the mafic Hildebrand suite. Uh, the granites are also compositionally and texturally variable, ranging from megacrystic porphyritic granites through to finer grained granites with varying degrees of alteration, um, as shown here. In the Gawler Range Volcanics, the mafic component is within the lower Gawler Range Volcanics, and these comprise basaltic lava flows found in um, volcanic centres um, distributed throughout the province. Um, and these are generally characterised by amygdaloidal flow tops, suggesting that they're um, probably subaerial lava flows. Um, and we also have them preserved in drill core in the um, southern part of the Gawler Range, Gawler Ranges province as well. The felsic component of the lower Gawler Range volcanics are compositionally variable. Um, they range from rhyolitic to dacitic units, but there, are, there is also a volcanoclastic and, and an epiclastic um, component to this, um, to this package. And there are also some um, really nice depositional and textural features preserved, including um, flow folding and flow banding within the units. The upper Gawler Range volcanics um, are compositionally more homogeneous. It comprises two units, a rhyolitic unit and a dacitic unit. And these are generally um, porphyritic and um, comprise um, quite a large proportion of the volcanic province. So part one, mafic rocks and the mantle. So the gabbroic and basaltic um, intrusive units in the mafic Hildebrand suite have um, what we call enriched um, geochemical signatures. 
and these are characterised by enrichments in things that we would normally associate with crust rather than the mantle. So this includes um, things like enrichments in high field strength elements such as zirconium, thorium and yttrium as well as the rare earth elements. And what these um, signatures translate to are these um, sort of spiky um, patterns in their trace element compositions on these primitive mantle normalised um, diagrams. And so the patterns within these mafic rocks um, appear to resemble a bulk crust, which is shown in those um, that thick uh, light blue line. So to get a crustal signature in a mafic rock, there are um, a, a few processes that may be able to produce that. Um, and one of those is crustal contamination. So in order to um, look for crustal contamination in mafic rocks, we can look for correlations between the neodymium isotopic composition and um, things such as magnesium number, which is the ratio of um, iron and magnesium within the whole rock. So in the event of crustal contamination, we would expect to see a negative correlation between decreasing epsilon neodymium values and decreasing Mg numbers. What we see in the mafic Hildebus suite um, is actually a lack of correlation between these two proxies, suggesting that the heterogeneity in the isotopic composition um, is a primary um, source component and that there may have been a, um, a crustal imprint in that mantle source. And so we've interpreted this as maybe representing an ancient subducted crustal component that's been stored within the subcontinental lithospheric mantle and that this was the source to produce the mafic Hildebus suite. When we look a bit further at what the composition of that mantle source might look like, we can use um, thorium niobium as a proxy for crustal input. So low thorium niobium ratios um, equate to mantle values and high thorium niobium ratio, ratios represent a crustal component and this could be a subduction related component or an assimilated related component. So the mafic Hildebus suite have high oh, and variable thorium niobium um, ratios. The majority of the suites sit within the field labelled subduction modified lithosphere with the high thorium niobium ratios. Um, but we do see some samples that have the lower thorium niobium ratios and this suggests a, a more depleted component um, within that mantle source. Um, so this is representing a heterogeneous or perhaps even multiple mantle sources responsible for the formation of the mafic Kildeper suite. When we look at the extrusive rocks, so these are the basalts from the Gola Range Volcanics, uh, we see that they mostly correspond to a singular uh, source region, and that is a metas within the metasomatized mantle array or the subduction modified lithosphere. So this is really highlighting the importance of using both the intrusive and the extrusive component to look at the different um, mantle sources within this large igneous province. If we're just focused on the basaltic component, for example, we would have missed that heterogeneity that we see within the um, the Hilda Persuade. So here just to uh, reiterate what um, that variation looks like. Um, within the Hilda Persuade um, we see compositional diversity and this could represent multiple sources which could be something like tapping a deeper source from a mantle plume and melting um, from the subcontinental lithospheric mantle whereas the basalts are solely um, derived from a metasomatized subcontinental lithospheric mantle source. And this type of relationship where the intrusive rocks show um, those multiple sources, um, that compositional, compositional diversity, and the extrusive component um, showing a singular source is similar to other plume lithosphere related large igneous provinces such as the Emishan and the Tarim large igneous provinces in China. <clears throat> Part two, volcanic rocks and models. So um, we have um, recent high precision geochronology 
um, for uh, various stratigraphic units within the Gola Range volcanics. And this has um, allowed us to be able to track the tempor temporal compositional evolution within those units and also place um, relative um, temporal constraints on the mafic volcanism. So this means that we can have a really detailed look at the variation within the geochemistry and the isotope um, compositions of these units and track how they um, change throughout the evolution of the, the volcanism. So we know the Gola Craton um, has a long geolo geological history and that involved various cycles of tectonism, deformation, metamorphism and magnetism that occurred from the Archean and that these um, events likely influenced the resulting mantle and crustal compositions and subsequent melting events. These ancient processes may have been responsible for forming the subcontinental lithospheric mantle beneath the Gola Craton and need to be kept in mind when thinking about um, models for formation. Some of the recent models um, in the formation of the Gola Range Volcanics and Hildebus Suite involve a complex history of subduction, slab rollback and delamination. And here we have um, two of, of um, the recent models um, proposed by Skiru et al, Antity and Giles. So the two panels on the left are the models of Skiru um, that include ancient processes that um, date back to the Archean. Um, and these include um, that complex history of subduction and slab rollback and also delamination for the formation of the Gola Range volcanics. On the panels on the right um, is the model of Tiddy and Giles. Um, and these use a model that is um, likened to Phanerozoic silicic large igneous provinces um, and suggests that the metasomatism um, responsible for the um, in the subcontinental lithospheric mantle was a recent process um, um, as what we see in the silicic large igneous provinces. In any proposed model, key geological features need to be accounted for. Um, as the recent analogy for the Gola Range Volcanics and Hildebus Suite um, is a Phanerozoic slip, we will look at um, some of the features that are typical of a uh, silicic large igneous province, a mafic large igneous province with voluminous silicic magmatism, and also the Gola Range Volcanics. The tectonic setting within a uh, silicic large igneous province is typically a convergent margin, so this is a subduction related. Um, setting, whereas mafic large igneous provinces generally occur in cratonic interiors um, and have a mantle plume component, and the Gola Range volcanics um, were uh, formed in a craton interior setting. When we look at the crustal composition in silicic large igneous provinces, the crust is um, generally fertile and hydrous and ranges from Proterozoic to Phanerozoic in age whereas the crust in mafic large igneous provinces and the Gola Range volcanics are typically refractory, Archean and Proterozoic crust, which is generally dry. When we look at the geochemical composition in silicic large igneous provinces, they're typically felsic, so these range from dacite to rhyolites and are generally calcalkaline um, and high in potassium. In mafic large igneous provinces, um, there's a bimodal component, um, they're alkalkalic, enriched um, geochemical and isotopic compositions. Uh, we see a similar type of scenario in the Gola Range volcanics. We have the bimodal component, which is the upper and the lower Gola Range volcanics. They're typically alkaline to alkali calcic. They're also enriched in high field strength elements um, and also have enriched isotopic compositions. Magmatic processes also vary between the Silicic Large Igneous provinces and the Mafic Large Igneous provinces. In silicic large igneous provinces, um, the main process is generally crustal melting of fertile hydrous lower crust, whereas in the mafic large igneous provinces, there are fractional crystallization and assimilation processes um, of the basaltic magmas, as well as a, a um, contribution of continental lithosphere. In the Gola Range volcanics, we also see relationships of fractional crystallization and assimilation from the basaltic component to produce the felsic component. Um, it's largely melting of an anhydrous refractory crust, but also a component of continental lithosphere 
um, contribution as well. The magmatic temperatures also vary between these two different settings. In Silicic Large Igneous Provinces, they're generally low temperature, so between 700 and 770 degrees Celsius. Whereas in the Mafic Large Igneous Provinces and the Gawler Range Volcanics, these are greater than 790 degrees and even up to 1100 degrees, so they're quite hot. The volumes of felsic magma produced are also significantly different between Silicic Large Igneous Provinces and the Mafic Large Igneous Provinces with Silicic Magmatism, and that is um, much greater volumes of felsic lava are produced in Silicic Large Igneous Provinces compared to the Mafic Large Igneous Provinces and also the Gola Range Volcanics. So the volumes that we see within the Gola Range Volcanics um, are more similar to those produced in the Mafic Large Igneous Provinces with Silicic Magmatism. There's also a difference in the duration of, of magmatism. So in Silicic Large Igneous Provinces, um, they tend to be quite long lived, so 20 to 50 million years, whereas in the Mafic Large Igneous Provinces, um, they're generally around 5 million years, and the new high precision geochronology that we have for the Gola Range Volcanics suggests that magmatism last, lasted for about 7, mil uh, 7 million years. <clears throat> So these features suggest that the Gola Range Volcanics and Hildebastweet share more features with mafic large igneous provinces accompanied by silicic volcanism related to mantle plumes rather than silicic large igneous provinces as, as they're defined. So this suggests that they sit outside of the conceptual model established for silicic large igneous provinces and they're actually more akin to a mafic large igneous province with silicic volcanism. So as Matt Pankhurst suggested about 10 years ago, um, we should probably be re referring to this as the Gawler Large Igneous Province rather than a Silicic Large Igneous Province. Here we just have some diagrams um, illustrating the plumbing systems for continental large igneous provinces associated with mantle plumes. These are from Richard Ernst, published a couple of years ago. Um, showing a cross-section and a plan view of the different components within these large igneous provinces and also the components that we see in um, the Gola Range Volcanics. So we can see that they share common features of a, a basalt province, a silicic province, uh, periphery small sedimentary basins and also a peripheral um, distribution of dikes and intrusions around um, the basalt and the um, silicic province. So we're getting the suggestion that there may have been a mantle plume involved in the formation of the Gola Range Volcanics. So what might crustal melting above a mantle plume look like and how might we be able to assess, assess it? Well, in 2019, Lua Al compiled all of the um, magmatic temperature data for silicic rocks within large igneous provinces and plotted them against their age and found that they showed um, similar features in the variation of temperature with the magmatic evolution. And they summarise this um, as representing the lower temperatures in the early stages were related to melting of metasomatised materials at the base of the lithosphere, melting of refractory materials in the crust required high temperatures, so in the middle stages um, there was an increase in magmatic temperatures, and then as the mantle plume began to decay, um, magmatic temperatures um, began to decline again. And we see a similar trend in the Gawler Range volcanics. So here we have the median titanium in zircon um, temperatures for Gawler Range volcanic units um, that are constrained by the high precision geochronology and showing the variation in the maximum temperatures recorded um, from the titanium in zircon. And we see a similar pattern with lower temperatures in the early stages. Um, in the middle stages, they reach maximum and then um, decreasing. Um, and so this is consistent with um, the mantle uh, melting above a mantle plume. So now looking at isotopes and how we can use them to um, look at the sources and interactions between those sources. 
so here we have the um, isotopic evolution of the andesitic and the basaltic rocks from the Gola Range volcanics um, plotted against their relative age um, based on where they sit in the stratigraphy. And um, so here in epsilon near dimium space, the crustal values are towards the left of the screen and the mantle values are towards the right. So what we see is in the early stages, um, we have um, juvenile, so mantle-like near dimium um, signatures. And this style of magmatism is consistent with a depleted high volume um, magmatism consistent with the early plume head driven melts. During the middle stages, we see a decrease in the epsilon near dimium values, which could be correlated to increasing enrichment, which may be due to longer crustal residence times, so incorporation of crustal material perhaps. And in the final stages, we see an isotopically juvenile source, which could represent a rejuvenation stage. Here we have the isotopic evolution for the dacitic and rhyolitic rocks. Actually, show a, a, the opposite trend in the epsilon near dimium values. And so, what we're seeing here is the volcanic rocks show a change in the melting dynamics that reflect the transition from a metasomatized subcontinental lithospheric mantle derived melts and differentiation processes to then large scale crustal melting in the, um, particularly in the younger stages um, in the upper GRV. When we look at the Hildebusui, it does become a little bit more difficult, and that's because there is significant overlap in the geochemical and the neodymium isotopic compositions between the felsic and the mafic component in the Hildebusui. Um, but what this does tell us is that they probably shared a similar source region from within the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, but the, the granites probably also experienced some sort of crustal assimilation as well as fractional crystallization processes on top of that. And so this is also another um, demonstration of using both the intrusive and the extrusive components to get a better understanding of what the different source um, compositions are and how they interacted. So the final part of this talk is looking at zircon geochemistry and how this adds additional information into magmatic processes and sources. <clears throat> so in this um, component, we divided the rocks um, first based on their age, but also whether they showed evidence of mineralization or alteration related to mineralization. And in general, the older rocks um, tended to have um, pyrite sericite alteration or presence of sulfides such as pyrite and chalcopyrite, whereas the younger, the younger rocks um, tended to be absent of these features. And so this is also coming off some of the work that Liam Courtney Davies and Jocelyn McPhee and Alex Terry have been doing with high precision geochronology around um, Olympic Dam and the Acropolis um, prospects which have shown that the mineralization occurred between about 1594 and 1590 million years ago. And so this matches up quite well with our older rocks um, that tend to show um, signs of um, alteration and mineralization compared to the younger component. So we selected samples um, from a wide geographic region across the Gola Craton and they included examples of mineralization related granites, mineralization absent granites, as well as um, mineralization related and absent um, Gola Range volcanics. <coughs> so here we have um, the Europium anomaly versus Hafnium for mineralization absent Hildebusweet and a mineralization absent upper Gola Range volcanics. Uh, where we use europium and hafnium as a measure of fractionation. So decreasing europium and incre increasing hafnium um, is, um, is increasing fractionation. And what we see is the mineralization absent zircon have a low europium um, anomaly ratios. When we compare this to mineralization related Hildebusweet zircon and mineralization related lower GRV zircon, we see that they, 
that these are mineralization related zircon have higher europium anomalies but they also form separate magmatic paths compared to the younger mineraliza mineralization absent zircon. When we look at the rest of the Hildebus suite um, that are mineralization absent, we can see that there is a large variation in the, in the europium anomalies within these zircons, but it is common um, that they're less than 0.2. And we also see for the mineralization related Hildebusweet um, that they generally have higher European anomaly values um, and that that range is actually a bit narrower than what we see in the mineralization absent um, zircon. So what we see is a high europium anomaly value and separate europium and hafnium arrays in the mineralization related zircon and that these may be related to complex magma recharge and mixing followed by cooling and crystallization processes and these tend to be more common to ore forming magma chambers. So this may be a reason why we see this variation in the older mineralized co component um, compared to the younger mineralization absent component. So here we have um, temperature, uh, titanium as a proxy for temperature, again um, plotted against hafnium as a measure of fractionation. And what we see is the mineralization absent zircon tend to have low titanium, um, which correspond to low temperatures. The lower temperatures could result from additional incorporation of low temperature crustally derived melts, which is something that we um, saw in the ice topic and the whole rock um, compositions is that there was um, far greater crustal input in those younger magmas compared to the older component. <clears throat> when we compare this to the mineralization associated zircon, they have much higher titanium, which correspond to higher temperatures at equivalent levels of fractionation, and that this higher temperature may be related to the subcontinental lithospheric mantle input in that in those earlier stages of magmatism. So the lower europium anomalies and titanium in the mineralization absence samples could be a function of incorporation of ancient crustal melts that were likely to be reduced and um, this may be a mechanism to lower the oxidation state and the temperatures. So this suggests that there were differences in magmatic source and processes as the magmatism in the large igneous province evolved. And so this really supports what we see in the whole rock geochemistry and the ice and the isotope geochemistry. <clears throat> so just putting the, um, the story together, the first um, part of the talk looked at mafic rocks um, and how these provide insight into the mantle composition. So the mafic Hildebus suite indicate mantle heterogeneity and multiple mantle sources, whereas the Gola Range of volcanics reflect a single source from, when, from within the subcontinental lithospheric mantle. And this type of relationship is um, also seen in other large igneous provinces related to mantle plumes. In part two, we looked at volcanic rocks and how they provide constraints on tectonic settings and models for formation. Um, and importantly, that the Gola Range volcanics show a change in the melting dynamics that reflect a transition from subcontinental lithospheric mantle derived melts and differentiation processes in the early stages, so predominantly in the lower GRV, and then these change to large scale crustal melting in the upper GRV, and this um, is consistent with a plume lithosphere model. <coughs> Third part looked at isotopic compositions and that they show the complex interplay of mantle and crustal melting and mixing processes. And lastly, the zircon trace element geochemistry adds information about oxidation state, magma temperatures and potentially magma fertility. The lower degrees of fractionation, higher oxidation state and higher magmatic temperatures in um, are related to subcontinental lithospheric mantle input in the older magmas, whereas incorporation of ancient crustal derived material in young, younger magmas results in lower oxidation state and lower magmatic temperatures. So just to sum up finally, the Gola Large Igneous Province is similar 
to an intracontinental setting analogous to a mafic large igneous province with voluminous silicic magmatism. Plume generated melting of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle can account for compositional and genetic vari variabilities in the igneous rocks um, formed in the same tectonic setting. <clears throat> so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, the funding for this research was provided by the ARC Linkage Source to Spectrum, which was um, funded by all the sponsors listed here. So thank you. And thanks for your attention.